Hey everybody, what's going on? It's Mr. Harvey here. Really excited. Today we are talking about the art of the Northern Renaissance. So in our last lecture, we were talking about the Northern Renaissance movement, right? A movement that occurred more in Northern Europe, the Low Countries, aka Belgium, the Netherlands, parts of the Germanic territories within the HRE, a movement based on religion, religious reform. Um, and today we're going to be talking about some of the art that came out of that uh, of the Northern Renaissance. Okay, now something that's really important for us to understand is that the Northern Renaissance art is different from the Italian Renaissance art. They're not the same thing. These are two different art movements. Okay, so and it's really important that there are some similarities, but there are clear contrasts between the two movements. Okay, um, you can't just say Renaissance art. You need to be specific, whether you're talking about Italian Renaissance art or Northern Renaissance art. Okay, there's some clear differences in, and there are some similarities, but there's some clear differences that I really want to focus on. Okay, one of the clear differences is the materials used in the painting. In the Northern Renaissance, they painted in oil as opposed to the frescoes, that plaster that we saw in the Italian Renaissance. Why is there a difference in the painting? Well, the climate. Okay, in Italy, it's very hot. Okay, and they were able to use that plaster because it dried so quickly and they, you know, they painted over that plaster. Um, in the nor in northern Europe, it's a little bit colder. There's a little bit more rain, okay, a little bit more moisture, all right. Um, and so they painted in oil to kind of protect their paintings, okay, to make sure to, to you know make them a little bit water resistant, all right, in case they got uh, you know any moisture on them, okay. So oil is definitely going to be used in the northern uh, Renaissance art. Another difference that we're going to see are some of the themes, all right. In the Italian Renaissance, and you know this is kind of review, uh, the classics. The Greeks and Romans, we saw that all over their art, all right? In Northern uh, Northern Renaissance art, we are going to see a lot of religious themes, okay? Religion, Christianity is going to be a really big theme that we are going to see in Northern Renaissance art. And that makes sense because the Northern Renaissance was much more religiously based, specifically religious reform. There's a lot more religion uh, and religious ideas going on in the Northern Renaissance than the Italian Renaissance. So we're going to see that reflected in their art. Another difference that we're going to see, ladies and gentlemen, is who financed the art. In the Italian Renaissance, we saw the papacy, the clergy financing the art, okay? Wealthy merchants financing the art, all right? In uh, the Northern Renaissance, we're going to see princes and kings really financing the art that we see, okay, and financing this movement, all right? Um, let's talk about some of the characteristics of the Northern Renaissance art, all right? One of the characteristics that we're going to see, and I'm super excited to go over this and, and, and talk about this, is the level of detail. Now, this is a continuation of medieval art, this medieval attention to detail, but we're going to see in, in some of these artistic pieces, detail, 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 and it's going to be just incredible to see. I'm really excited for you all to kind of take a look at these paintings and just notice how much detail there is in there. All right, um, we're going to see and this is really important for Northern Renaissance art and a clear contrast from Italian Renaissance art is less of an emphasis on the Greeks and Romans, AKA the classics. They're not gonna be emphasizing the classics as much. We're gonna see, you know, realism, naturalism, all right? We'll see some fantasy, some more, some supernatural, uh, you know, themes, but the Greeks and Romans are not gonna show up as much. There's less emphasis on that, which makes sense because the Northern Renaissance wasn't necessarily focused on that, okay? We're gonna see landscapes, okay? We're gonna see an emphasis on the middle class and peasant life, which totally makes sense for the Northern Renaissance because the Northern Renaissance was a more inclusive movement as opposed to the Italian Renaissance, which was more exclusive to the elite, right? The elite participated in the Italian Renaissance. Wealthy merchants participated in um, the Italian Renaissance, the clergy, the, the, the Pope, the papacy, the Catholic Church, which had a lot of money and power participating in that. In the Northern Renaissance, we're going to see more in their art, more emphasis on the middle class and peasant life because, well, more of these so, uh, peoples of these socioeconomic backgrounds participated within that movement. Okay? Um, we're going to see incredible detail with, uh, you know, houses, but also landscapes as well. But there, there, there's some incredible details within domestic interiors which we'll see in some of the art, all right? And we're also gonna see some just incredible portraits, okay, within Northern Renaissance art, all right? Um, let's, talk, let's talk about some of our important artists, okay? Now, 
Some of y'all might be saying, Harv, dude, do we have to memorize all of these artists? The answer is no. Now, should you be familiar with, some, with their, with you know, the majority of their names? Yes, you should be able to recognize some of these figures, but memorize, not necessarily, okay? Now, what I, mean, th what I would do and what I, what I would recommend for y'all is to, for each artistic movement that we're gonna go over, because we're gonna go over many, you know, make sure that maybe you memorize maybe one or two prominent artists from that time period. You know, for example, in the Italian Renaissance, I always remember the Ninja Turtles and that, you know, helps remember many artists, but, you know, I, I, I kind of remember the two, for me, my, the, my, the two really, you know, important artists that I always remember are Leonardo and Mike, Michelangelo, okay? Jan Van Eyck is an artist that I would definitely know for the Northern Renaissance. Really, uh, really famous. He was a, a, an innovator, um, and he was one of the most prominent artists in this movement, all right? We're going to see lots of religious symbolism within his art, detail in his art. I mean, take a look um, at this painting with the clothing, the detail, the floor, the detail, just incredible detail. Uh, and we do see some religious symbolism within this. You know, for example, the uh, the man right here, this figure, is, it seems like he's, he's got his hands together, almost like he's praying. Okay. We see uh, the woman in the background have wings. You know, that might suggest that she's some type of uh, angel. Okay. So a lot of religious symbolism, a lot of detail in uh, Jan Van Eyck's art. Okay. Let's take a look at some more paintings. All right. Again, right here, the detail, okay? I mean, look at this, incredible. It's hard to kind of probably see on the screen, um, but if you were to zoom in, I mean, you have the inscriptions right here. Just incredible, okay? The clothing, that detail, incredible. The landscape, the detail, the different trees. Detail, religion, those are gonna be really prominent themes within the art, all right? Again, look at this. In these two paintings, the crucifixion and the last judgment, right? We can see the detail, but also we see we see religious themes within this art. So th those are those are the things that I really want you all to be paying attention as and, and thinking about when you think about Northern Renaissance art: detail and definitely um, you know themes of religion, and that makes sense for the for the um, the Northern Renaissance movement as a whole. Okay. Now this is one of my uh, favorite paintings, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, because the level of detail in this painting is just incredible. Okay, it, 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 it just, it's just incredible. Um, uh, this was, uh, you know, uh, considered a wedding portrait. All right, um, but this, um, but this painting, ladies and gentlemen, take a look at this mirror right here. Okay, just, just incredible. Let's take a look at the, at the, at the next, um, at the next, at the next uh, slide right here. The artist. Okay, this is this is really cool. The artist painted himself in the painting, doing the painting. Let me repeat that. The artist put himself in the painting, you know, in this small little background right here in the in, in the mirror. It's just incredible. I mean, look at the level of detail right here within the house. Look at this. Just incredible. Okay, just incredible detail, all right? The detail right here, just incredible. Let's, let's kind of zoom in right here. This is uh, the, uh, um, just an incredible painting right here uh, by Wyden. Take a look at this detail. The tears, okay, just incredible. The detail in this art, it's amazing. And I would love, uh, love for us to go on a field trip and go look at this art because you can just look at some of these paintings and just and just the details just just really stand out okay now quentin massey's is another uh famous artist okay he belonged uh to a humanist circle that included erasmus okay and he uh uh you know he he used some uh techniques of fantasy realism okay um this is one of his uh more famous paintings called the ugly duchess okay um, Massey is definitely a really important artist. And this uh, painting, again, you're going to see his level, the level of detail. Okay, check this out. This is called The Money Lender and the Wife. Okay, and his wife. All right, take a look at the detail in this painting. All right, let's focus right here kind of on this glass. All right, the coins. All right, and the book. I mean, look at that. In the glass right here, they're painting what the outside looks like, the reflection in the glass. Take a look at the book, the, 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 uh, the pages, you can see the actual pages. You can see the writing on the book. I mean, the level of detail is just incredible. 
Okay, the money, the level of detail on the money, just incredible. I mean, think about how how you know specific he's being. Just think about how meticulous he's being in painting all that. How much time that probably took. How careful you have to be, right? He, look at that. He he is inscribing the the coins. Let's go back. The little coins right here. He's inscribing each of them. That is just impressive, and stands out to me. Okay, um, some of our more uh, German Northern Renaissance painters, we have Lucas Cranach the Elder, okay? Uh, he was a very famous painter in Wittenberg. We're gonna talk about Wittenberg in the next chapter, but you know, some of his best portraits were of Martin Luther. We'll get to Martin Luther in chapter three, but he is gonna be our leader of Lutheranism and the Protestant Reformation. And that Protestant Reformation starts in Wittenberg. All right, um, uh, here are some other paintings of Lucas Cranach the Elder. Right, this old man with the young woman, and this old woman with the young man. Okay. All right. Uh, we've talked about this uh, artist before, Albert Durier. He was the greatest of the German artists, considered the greatest by uh, many historians. Okay, he was a scholar as well as an artist. His patron was the uh, Emperor Maximilian I of the HRE, and he was really similar to, um, to to Da Vinci. He was very much a Renaissance man. He was a scientist. He wrote books on geometry, fortifications, humans, okay? And he was very much known for his portraits and his woodcuts, which we've already seen in class with the four horsemen. Okay, but there is Drouet and a portrait. Pretty incredible. Remember, back then they don't have they weren't able to take selfies, so this is kind of their version of the selfie. Alright, and we've seen this before, right? The four horsemen. And he was a master of the woodcut. Okay? And he was also, and this was a similarity, this is a, a kind of an influence that he brought in from the Italian Renaissance, is he introduced a lot of proportion and perspective into his art. But just, this is incredible, this woodcut, I mean, carved into wood, and then pressed in ink. Just the level of detail, incredible. And obviously, this is very much an, a, a piece from the Northern Renaissance, because we have, um, you know, we have a lot of detail in this, but also religiously themed, right? This comes from the Bible. Okay. A self-portrait of Drurier. Just incredible. Look at the detail in here. The individual hairs. Okay. His hair being ref the light reflecting off the hair versus the, the, uh, the light not, you know, he's, he's putting the lighting in the painting. P pretty incredible. Okay. The, the light reflecting in his eyes. Okay. Pretty incredible. All right. Another woodcut, The Last Supper, right? We have religion in here, but the level of the detail. Okay, pretty amazing. Okay, now take this out. This is called the, uh, uh, take a look at this. This is called the Triumphal Arch. All right, this is incredible. Look at the detail within this artistic piece. Look at that detail. Just incredible. Look at that. Think about how much time that took. Look at that, each person's spear and weapon. Okay. The detail, 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 detail. Definitely a big theme within the Northern Renaissance. Okay, and here's his, here's his four horsemen of the apocalypse, that woodcut. Just incredible. Okay, Drurier, All right? Now, um, in Spain, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna see um, our most famous Spanish artist is known as El Greco. Now, he is not Spanish, okay? He is, he is actually, his name is El Greco, he's the Greek, um, but he did a lot of his paintings in Spain, all right? And he is gonna be um, our most famous painter for another movement called Mannerism, okay? So El Greco, when you hear Mannerism, you need to think about El Greco. He is the artist that I want you to know. Okay, he is the artist that I want you to know. Okay, now take a look at this painting right here. This is not, okay, Renaissance art. Okay, this is not Renaissance art. And think about how this painting right here, ladies and gentlemen, might differ from Renaissance art. How might it be a little bit different? There is a similarity. We see religion right here, but there are some clear differences. Okay, think about it, and we're going to kind of get, uh, get into it. All right, let's kind of press pause and think about it for a second. All right, unpause. 
one of the big differences that we're going to see and what mannerism was all about, mannerism is a rebellion against Renaissance art. It's a rebellion against a uh, perspective. It's a rebellion against realism. Okay. And so one of the things that we're going to see one of the, and one of the themes that we're going to see within mannerist art is, you know, uh, in, in El Greco's art is he's not going to use proportion and perspective. He's going to make things, you know, um, distorted, okay, elongated. It's not, he's, he's not going to really necessarily make things directly proportional and perfect. He's going to elongate, distort things. And he's doing this on purpose as kind of, uh, you know, to spite Renaissance art and that, that idea of, you know, seeing things in perfect proportion perspective as humans see. You know, he's, he's, he's manipulating the color, manipulating uh, the figures to be, um, to be disproportionate. Okay, and take a look. I mean, the arms are a little bit longer, elongated. Okay, the colors, not necessarily realistic. Okay, he's doing that on purpose. All right, this is a picture that I took um, from the Louvre, okay, uh, by El Greco. Uh, and again, you can see that the color's not necessarily re uh, very realistic, and the proportions are off. Okay. All right. Same thing here, uh, okay? Manipulating the proportions, manipulating the perspective, okay? Not necessarily following those rules of perspective and proportion, okay? And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, messing around with the colors, okay? Making things not necessarily super realistic. That was definitely a theme within mannerism, ladies and gentlemen, okay, that we're going to see within El Greco. Okay? Same thing here, all right? Proportion, elongation. Those he's not following those rules of the Renaissance, okay? Especially the Italian Renaissance, where you have perfect perspective, perfect proportion, all that math that's in there, okay? Very realistic. No, he's not following that. El Greco is not, and that's that's the the big themes within mannerism. Not, and I have a slide that kind of describes that. But just look at this art, okay? It's 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 not it's it's not super realistic, and that's the point. It's a this is a rebellion and a reaction against Renaissance art. Okay, and that's El Greco. Okay, so like I said before, he is the most important Spanish artist of uh, this time period. Okay, and he was Greek. All right, and he was a mannerist, and like I said, he deliberately distorts, deliberately elongates. Okay deliberately uh, manipulates the color, okay? He is, he is rebelling against the Renaissance art, the realism, the, the perspective, the proportion, okay? He is, he is, um, he is rebelling against uh, uh, that movement, okay? He is ignoring that, right? He's manipulating the color. And we're going to see that later on in other movements too, is that is, is, uh, especially in Baroque art, the, uh, using color, all right, and 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 I, I um, that's one of my favorite characteristics about some of the art that we're going to be seeing later in the year is the use of color, and he definitely does that. He he's he, he's kind of getting into that. Um, uh, he's definitely using that within his art, manipulating the color, ignoring, uh, you know, realism, and putting, you know, he might adding a different, you know, shade of a color to manipulate the uh, the um, the art. Okay. Um, and his works were definitely uh, an expression of the Spanish Counter-Reformation, which, which we'll talk about. Baroque art is also an expression of that. Um, but, he's, but the big thing that I really want you to memorize when it comes to El Greco and mannerism is he is rebelling against the Renaissance. Okay? Rebelling against the Renaissance. Oh, okay? Again, I mean, take a look. Kind of a, a different hue of this red from a cardinal. It's not necessarily a, you know, a pure red that that we know cardinal to be, the color cardinal to be. He's manipulating that on purpose, okay? Manipulating the skin color, okay? On purpose, okay? And we see that again here, all right? Manipulating perspective, mani distorting figures, okay? Distorting the color, all right? And this is El Greco and mannerism. Okay. All right. So 
Um, really important for us to understand, ladies and gentlemen, is that, um, the, uh, and I'll kind of you know wrap things up real quickly, the Northern Renaissance, ladies and gentlemen, uh, was uh, you know a very complex movement when it came to art. The big themes that I want you all to remember, detail, religion, those are very, very important themes that we saw within the Northern Renaissance. And the Northern Renaissance art ended with mannerism, which was really a, a, a rebellion against um, uh, Renaissance art. Okay. All right. We'll stop here for today, ladies and gentlemen. That will be the end of it. Great job. Thank you so much. Okay. And I will see you for our next lecture on the age of exploration. Take care.